Hello, my name is Jennifer Bacall, and I'm with Programs, Partnerships, and Outreach for the Harris County Public Library. We're very excited to have you joining us today as we all learn about martial arts. We're going to see some moves that we can do ourselves. We're going to see all sorts of cool weapons and other things. And also, if you are in our summer reading program, don't forget you get five points for participating in a program today. So without further ado, let me introduce Whit. Hello. My name is Whit McClendon, and I run Jade Mountain Martial Arts in Katy, Texas. Um, all of my students call me Sifu, and that just means teacher. Uh, some of you may have also heard the term sensei for a karate teacher. Now, uh, at my school, we teach kung fu and kickboxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We, we teach a lot of things, tai chi. And so I get uh, questions a lot of times on uh, what are the differences in the martial arts, you know, uh, and, and where do they come from? And so uh, I think the most common martial art that most people recognize is Taekwondo. Now that martial art comes from Korea and has a lot of really fabulous kicking skills, okay? Uh, many, many of my students tell me that they've trained in that and it's fantastic stuff. Now, uh, those of you who've heard of karate and judo and jiu-jitsu, those things come from Japan. Uh, and so uh, a lot of really good martial arts from there. And uh, some people say, well, if jiu-jitsu comes from Japan, what about Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Wow, there's a story. Because a jiu-jitsu and judo master from Japan went to Brazil a long time ago and taught two families down there. And they took the jiu-jitsu that he taught them and expanded on it and trained in it and made a lot of changes to it. And now it's exploded and it is a different art. It's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, very specific to, the, to uh, Brazil. So now, uh, as I said, I am the head Kung Fu instructor at Jade Mountain Martial Arts. And uh, what Kung Fu do we teach? And what, uh, the, the thing that I know most about is Northern Mantis Kung Fu, or Praying Mantis Kung Fu. Now, there are a lot of different styles of Praying Mantis, um, but uh, the Northern style is what I'm the most familiar with. Now, uh, it's an interesting story. There, there's a legend of how Praying Mantis Kung Fu came to be. And uh, the, the style, that style of Kung Fu is about 500 years old. And it was created in the beginning by a Shaolin monk named Wang Long. Okay? Now he was training at the Shaolin temple and he was, every time he would practice fighting with his older Kung Fu brother, the abbot, now he was the guy in charge, okay? Uh, he was a little bigger, a little stronger than Wang Long. And Wang Long, he, he always lost. He, he would do his best using the fighting techniques that he knew, but his older Kung Fu brother always won. And so uh, he decided to go and take a break and go traveling through the woods to meditate and think on this and see if maybe he could come up with a way to improve himself because he was very frustrated. So um, while he was walking through the woods and just thinking, man, you know, my, my older Kung Fu brother is bigger and stronger and he knows all my moves and I just can't beat him and I'm so frustrated. Well, as he was walking along the path, he saw two insects fighting. One was a praying mantis, which gets its name from its claws up in the front that kind of look like they're praying, see, like this. And it was fighting a much bigger insect, it was a beetle you know, or a cicada, it was a much bigger thing. And so Wang Wang looked down and saw this conflict, this fight between these insects, and he saw that the mantis was much smaller, and he thought about himself losing all his fights, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, little guy, I guess you're going to not going to make it. Well, would you believe that the mantis won? It overpowered, it beat this bigger, stronger insect and kind of made it its lunch. And Wang Wang watched this and said, oh my goodness, I didn't expect that. Hmm, a smaller insect beat the bigger, stronger insect. I wonder if there's something I could learn from this. So he captured the praying mantis and looked at it. And the praying mantis 
Uh, they were very brave and very aggressive. It was, I'm not scared of you. What? What do you want? And so what he did is he took a stick and gently poked at the mantis to see what it would do. And every time he tried to poke the mantis, the mantis would use its claws and block and parry and move so that it would keep itself safe. And he thought, now that's, that's new. That's a style of movement I've never seen before. So he made a little cage for the mantis and kept it nearby. And then he started to practice. So he would poke at the mantis and see what it would do. And then he would try to imitate it and see, well, let's see, if it, a punch comes in this way, I can block it here, I can block it here. And so he started creating his own style of Kung Fu. So after a while, he started feeling like he might be pretty good at this. And so he set the mantis free and went back to Shaolin. So when he comes back, he was greeted very warmly by the abbot. Oh, Wang Wang, you're back. You want to fight again? You want to lose? I mean, you want to spar a little? And Wang Wang said, yes, I have some new things I would like to share with you, some new moves. So let's try them out. So when they sparred this time, Wang Wang won. His new techniques worked wonderfully. And instead of being upset at finally getting beaten, the abbot was excited. Oh my gosh, Wang Wang, this is amazing, this new style you've discovered. What do you call it? Well, uh, praying mantis. Awesome. Let's teach this to everybody here because it's so amazing. And so, now that was a long, long time ago. And from that, those few people, it spread out across China, and now there are many different styles of Kung Fu, uh, or, or uh, of Praying Mantis Kung Fu, even. Uh, Eight-Step Praying Mantis, Seven Star Praying Mantis, Tai Chi Plum Flower Mantis, there's, there's a lot of different styles. And so, um, when we want to practice this style of Kung Fu, certain things that you need to remember. Now, when we start doing stuff at home, I want to make sure that you are not punching your brothers or sisters, you're not punching your, your pets, and being very careful around the house. Yes? Yeah? Everybody? Okay. Dahlia Lupo gives you a thumbs up. Yay! Thank you, Dahlia. I very much appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, the first thing we would do, is you can do this with me if you like, uh, you can stand up and bring yourself to attention. And this is how we would salute if we were going to do a class. You'll take your right fist, and I know this is my left, but I don't have a mirror, so this is your right fist like this. And this represents the knowledge you gain from martial arts. Like, I know how to fight, or I'm learning how to fight. I know how to defend myself. The open hand on the other side represents peace. You know, I prefer peace. When you put them together like this, it's a sign of respect, and also says, I do know how to fight, I can defend myself, but I prefer peace instead. And so this is how we would start, and we bow to show respect. So there's a lot of other little things that I'm gonna show you today and stuff that you can follow along with me. One of the things that drew me into martial arts because I simply thought it was cool was all the weapons that you get to learn. Now, I have to say, when I first came into martial arts, I really wanted to learn just one weapon. That was it, I was super excited. But my teacher took them away from me and said, no, nope, you have to learn other stuff first. Uh, and he was right. I needed to learn to use my mind and my hands and all of the other stuff I had to use my body before I could use a weapon. So, however, today I'm gonna show you some of the weapons because, well, because they're really cool. So, now the first weapon that you would learn after learning punches and kicks and so forth would be the stick. Uh, no, it's it's a, stick. a stick. Long, it can be taller than you. A lot of times I'll use one that's even taller, and you can use it to block and strike. <laughs> Sweeping blocks and strikes and pokes and all kinds of things. <laughs> and so, also, it's great for beginners because it has no sharp edges. 
it's less likely you'll hurt yourself when you're training with a staff. But it teaches you a lot of things about distance and power, and it's fun. So that would be the staff. Now, I'll show you some of the other stuff. Once you learn the staff and get very good at it, then your teacher may say, hmm, okay, we're going to have to move up a notch. So we'll teach you the sword. Now, the first sword that we teach in my system is the Chinese broadsword. Now, it has one sharp edge here, but I will tell you that in class, none of the weapons we train with are sharp. Why would that be? Well, because we're trying to keep ourselves safe. But even though they're not sharp, we want to pretend that they are so that we can be careful and keep people safe around us. So, now this one would be sharp if it were sharp on this end only. And it is a swirling, fast weapon where you would block and then cut and stab. There's so much you can do with it. Oh. So that would be the Chinese broadsword. And the tassel on the end, a lot of times the soldiers would tie it like this to their wrist in case they accidentally dropped it in battle. And also they would use it in case their hands got wet, and so they would give themselves a better grip. But that would be the second weapon that you would use. But there's so many others. This is, like I said, this is why I got into Kung Fu. So let me show you some more. Now, a lot of times, uh, the Kung Fu weapons don't look much like weapons. For instance, if you can see here, this, it has holes in it because it is a flute. Oh. Now, I actually can play it, but I'm terrible at it, just to show you that it is an actual flute. That's the best I can do. I'm terrible at that. So, but also is really good for self-defense. So people couldn't have weapons, but they could have a flute. And so they could use it as a stick to block and block, but then stab and stab and block. Ha! So that's how you would use a flute as a weapon of self-defense. Boink, like that. So other things. Now, as you saw earlier, we have a fan up here. It is a little warm in here, I think. So, but this also was a popular kung fu weapon of self-defense. Doesn't look like much, but if you hold it, see this one is bamboo. All the little pieces, they're very thin wood. But even if they're just thin wood, if you hold it, and squeeze it tight together, it is very solid on either end, almost just like the flute would be. You can block and strike and stab and block, just the same as you would if you had a flute or a strong stick, even if it was metal. This still does a really good job. And sometimes, if they were really worried, they would put little tiny blades on the end of the fan. You wouldn't even know it because I can fan myself like this and still cut in self-defense. So very fancy the fan. Very sneaky and very noisy, but I like it. So what else? Now a lot as soon as I pull these out, a lot of people start to say, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles! And if you know who I'm talking about, then you would know that Raphael is the turtle that uses the side. So these are two weapons. You would use one in each hand. And these were very, very good for fighting against someone with a sword. You know, swords are super dangerous. But if you'll see, these have prongs along either side here, see? And so what someone would do is if someone swung a sword at you, 
you could reach up with this, it's very strong metal, and block it, and it would get caught inside the forks like that. And you could pin it there and then strike the other with the other side against the side of their sword, and it would bend it or maybe even break it. <laughs> Bang! And so now their weapon is useless, but yours is just fine. So you can strike with these, of course you can poke with these, as they're very long and pokey, but you've seen me flip them. I'm sure you've seen Raphael do that too. You could also strike down this way, boom, here, and stab, and flip it this way. And if you're holding it like this, this makes a very good extra shield on your arm to make it stronger, like that. So if somebody's coming over the head, ah, I can block it just like that. And one last little fun thing about these is that if you punch with it, that's very hard. So, hi. Very fun weapons to learn to use. So, wait, wait. So many others. We have, we have a few more that I'll show you. Now, this one. Baby Silver asks, does Kung Fu have belt colors? You know, many different, this, who is that that asked that? Baby Silver. Baby Silver. Mm -hmm. Hi, Baby Silver. On YouTube. That is a great question. Every school is different. I have been to schools where they actually do not have belt colors. And in fact, that was how my school was when I very, very first started, when I was a long time ago, when I was 12 years old. Everyone wore a black sash, but it didn't mean the same thing that it does everywhere else. Now, in my school, and in many, people will start with a white sash and then move up into different color belts, just as I think that most people recognize that, you know, a black belt or a black sash is a very high level in that martial art. And so every school has maybe a different color system that they use. In my school, it is white, gold, orange, purple, blue, green, brown, and then black. And I'll tell you something that a lot of people don't know. Most schools, a black belt does not necessarily mean master. It really means that you have reached a great level as a new start. So by the time you're a black sash, you actually can see that there's so much more to learn, but now you have more skill so that you can learn those things. So, okay, so I hope that answered your question, and moving on. Now this is a Chinese straight sword. Uh, it's called a jian, or a gim, and it is uh, a more elegant weapon. The other sword that I showed you before was one given mostly to folks in the army. Whack, whack, it was a little easier to learn to use, and basically just a, a, a strong chopping weapon, but this weapon instead required much more finesse because the end was smaller and it is designed so that it could reach forward and make tiny cuts but in very specific places. A lot of times this was considered a gentleman's or scholar's weapon because it was, it took longer to learn to use in that way. So, it is, I think it's a very pretty weapon. And it does a lot of very interesting things. Now, a lot of the weapons that you'll see, they're a little bit flexible. Now, in some styles, the flexible weapons that they use are very, very flexible. Uh, my style is considered a little more traditional, and so, although it does bend a little, this is just a practice weapon. Uh, and, and so it does flex a little bit, but not too much. So, okay, I'll put this one away. Baby Silver said thank you. You're very welcome. All right. I'm happy to answer any questions, by the way. So if you have a question about Kung Fu or martial arts or anything while I'm here, please feel free to post it. I am totally happy to answer it to the best of my ability. So let me see what other weapons I got over here. Ooh. Now, we talked about the Chinese broadsword earlier, and this one, it looks like 
just a single sword, right? But it's a little sneaky, and I'll show you why. See, it's one case. I'll put the case away. But the interesting thing about this is that it is actually two swords. You see, the handles fit together just like one, almost, see? And so the blades fit together and they all go inside one case, but they are two perfectly good swords. So you can block with one and cut with the other, and you have two weapons instead of just one. So these are a lot of fun. Okay, to be honest, I think all the weapons are a lot of fun, but that's just me. So let me put this one away. couple more, and then we can get to some things that you can follow along with me at home, right? Now this, I have to be extra careful with this one because it's very long. All right. Now this, it looks almost exactly like this, uh, the gim, the gin, the straight sword I showed you before. However, it is much, much longer and as you can see, its handle is long enough for me to put two hands on it. So this is a two-hand straight sword. Well, I gotta be careful swinging this around. So, because sometimes other folks would end up having much longer weapons, perhaps a spear or a staff, and they wanted a little bit more blade so that they can be a little safer as they defend themselves. So this is one of my favorites. Uh, all of them are my favorite, really. Okay. So I'll go ahead and put this one away. And then I got one more. Okay. All right. Now this is a Chinese spear, okay? Basically, the staff with a point on the end, a metal blade. Now, people say, well, what is the, uh, the red for? Well, this was traditionally horsehair, and it was dyed red so that it could distract the opponent when it's, being, when it's in battle. Okay? We wiggle it around, and it catches the eye. So, the thing about these kinds of spears is that you don't want to throw them, you know, because if I throw my spear at the bad guy, and if I miss, I have no spear, and the bad guy now has my spear. So that's a bad idea. Instead, we keep it close, and we use it to spear. Well, that's just like that. So we can block just like a staff. We can use both hands. And then block with the front end here. And then when the time is right, stab! Just like that. So, very, very fun weapon to use. And also one of my favorites. Again, all my favorites. So, does anybody have any questions about the weapons that we've gone over? Please go ahead and post them. Happy to answer them. Let me put this away. Good. Now, I'm going to show you some stuff that you can follow along at home, and we'll have a little fun. Now remember, what did I say before? Do not punch your brothers or sisters. Don't punch your pets. This is for practice, and I want you to enjoy it and do your very best, but at the same time, I want you to be careful, right? So, go ahead and stand up if you can. So we're right here, and we'll salute just like we did before. So remember, right hand is here, left hand is here. That is our peace over power salute. And then we can bow. Very good. Now, a lot of the stuff that we'll do has a formal opening called an ibe. And that looks like this. You start with your hands at your sides, like that. And then you turn your palms forward and go up all 
all the way up high over your head, and then bring it down behind your ears like you're listening, and then push, and then make two fists, turn them over, and then pull them right back to your belt, to your waist right here. Now that whole thing, we call it Ibe. It just means beginning. It's just how we start a lot of the stuff that we do. So let's do it again. We're here, hands down, turn the palms up, go up, and then down, push, make the fists, turn them over, and pull. Ibe. Maybe a little faster, a little slower. All right, here we go. Ready? Down, push, make the fists, and pull. Good. Let's go a little faster. Ready? Go. Oh, wait. That's too fast. That's too fast. Let's, let's go a little slower, a little slower. So up all the way, down like we're listening, push, and pull. Now that's eBay. So first, we're going to do just a few training punches. So you'll start. I want you to hop your feet out into a horse stance. Just like so. Knees are bent like you're sitting on an imaginary chair. Now, if you're at home right now and you're doing a horse stance and you're doing like this, it's too tall. Bend your knees and sit a little bit. If your legs get tired, it's okay. They're supposed to get tired. So we're right here. Now, what I want you to do is to punch with your right hand right out in front of your chest, right here, nice and strong. And then when you pull it back, the other hand goes out, just like that. And every time we punch, we breathe out. I like to say, Shh, like, you know, maybe I was an amazing librarian and someone was making too much noise. Usually that was me. So, Shh, just like that. So let's start right here. Hands here. Let's punch with the right hand first. Ready, one, Shh, and two, Shh, three, Shh, four, Shh, and five. Shh, awesome. Let's do two punches. What that's going to look like is here. Shh, sh. See? All the way out and then all the way back. So, ready? And one, sh, sh, two punches, ready? Two, sh, sh, three, sh, sh, four, sh, sh, and five, sh, sh. good. Now switch hands. So now you've got your left hand out there. Anybody's legs getting tired? Sometimes that happens. It's okay, you'll make it. So we're right here. Two punches, ready? One, sh, sh, two, sh, sh, three, sh, sh, four, sh, sh, and five. Fantastic. Now what we're going to do is jump up and put our feet together like that. And we're going to do an ending. Now the ending, we call it sow. So what you'll do is you put your hands up in front, bend your knees, and you're going to slap your hands like this and breathe in and out. Nice deep breath. And then push all that air out. Let's do that again. So our feet are together. We're standing nice and tall. Hands up in front, bend the knees, breathe in, and out. Good. So let's look at what we did. We did an eBay, we did some training punches, and then we did sound ending. So it's eBay, up, down, push, and pull. And we dropped into our horse stance. We did some punches. To finish, we came back up to attention and breathe in and out. Fantastic. Now, you saw us working on the horse stance. There are a lot of different stances in Kung Fu. So this one, in my class, I say, block chip, and we all come up to attention. That means we're ready to start. Horse stance is here. So let's go back up and horse stance. Make sure to bend those knees. Back up. Horse. Back up. Horse. Hold it. And then back up. Good. Anybody's legs tired yet? No? Good. We'll do some more stuff. Now, another stance that I like is the crane stance. Now, that takes good balance, so it's a really fun thing to practice. I really enjoy it. Now, one thing you can do is put your hands here, here, or if you feel like you have trouble with this one, you can put your hands out here. Let's start here. That will help you the most right now. Now, let's say you pick up your right foot, pick up your knee, and point your toe down, and then just hold it. That is a crane stance, because a lot of cranes, a lot of different birds, will stand with one leg up. So we're here, or here if your balance is pretty good, and here. And then you can 
challenge yourself and hold it as long as you can. But let's try this. We'll switch now. Let's do the other side. You can hold your hands out here if you need it. Up here and hold it to see how long you can stay there. And then you can put it down. Praying stance. Yes, ma'am. Julia, Nancy, Jennifer, and Angela give you thumbs up. Hey, all of you. Thank you so much. I need to get a list of all the names. I'm yes, so sorry I said it fast there. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And Yay. Angela also wondered um, a couple of things. Do you have a favorite movement? And what is the best tip for beginners? Ooh, okay, this is from Angela? Yes. Angela, those are good questions. Do I have a favorite movement? And do I have tips for beginners? Okay, oh my goodness. I love moving around, okay? And Kung Fu lets me do that in a lot of really interesting ways. Hmm, if I had to think, I would say I, my favorite movement is the sidekick. That's all. That's a sidekick. Because you can do a sidekick to the side. You can do it behind you. You can do it in front. You can pretty much do it anywhere. If I wanted to do it over there, well, then I would just use the other leg and put it down. So the sidekick is probably my favorite movement in martial arts. I really like that. My advice to beginners is, now this is really important, let yourself make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. That's how you learn, right? Sometimes people come into my school and I can see them getting so mad at themselves when they don't know Kung Fu. And they, of course they don't know Kung Fu. They're coming to learn Kung Fu. So if you let yourself make mistakes and understand that everyone makes them and you can learn from them, that's how, you, that's the best tip I can give you. And just keep trying to do your best and eventually you'll get really better at it. You'll get pretty good at it if you can let yourself do that. So that's my answer to that. Back up. Jennifer says, can you show them one more move? Sure. Any particular move? Uh, not listed. Okay, well, I can show a few Priscilla more. Ann says, thumbs up. Yay. All right, okay, here's, here's what I'll do. I will demonstrate a short Kung Fu routine. This form is called Dropping Force, okay? And uh, it's one of my favorites. I've actually known this one for many, many years. Uh, it looks like this. So that whole little sequence of movements is what we would call a form. Other systems might call it a kata, or they might call it a pattern. For us, we just call it a form. And a form, or a kata, is a, <clears throat> it is a sequence of movements simulating attack and defense against one or more opponents. So the idea is you're fighting imaginary people, and they're doing this particular punch, or this particular punch or maybe even a kick. And so the series of movements that you learn is to help you deal with this punch, that punch, that kick. If you look at this particular form that I just did, which is here, and I drop away. So maybe they swung something at me and I moved out of the way and then they tried to punch me. And so I blocked it down and then I retaliated. I tried to counterattack to get them to stop bothering me. But then they throw a kick. Oh no. And so I pull back and I block that kick out of the way. And then I try and get them to move away from me with a side kick. And I turn. This is, we call this one the talk to the hand. Talk to the hand. Get in the stomach. Leave me alone. But if they try and punch again, we grab and we punch back and kick and punch. And then we're done. So that is just one routine. We have so many. So many, many, many. But they're a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy doing them. So, anybody else have any questions? Um, one second, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Technical delay here. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what inspired you to learn martial arts? Oh my goodness, who asked that one? 
That's Angela again. Angela again. I'm so happy you're here, Angela. <laughs> what inspired me to learn martial arts? Well, there was several things. Now you have to remember, I was 12 years old, so I was I was a little, I was a lot younger, and I was bullied at school a lot. You know, I think a lot of us have to deal with that kind of thing, and it's unfortunate. But for me, a lot of it was because I wasn't very confident. I was very easy to pick on, you know, because I was very shy, and so I watched a lot of kung fu movies back then, and I read a lot of comic books. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if I could learn to defend myself like the people in those movies or like the people in those comic books? And so I talked with my parents, and I saved up my own money a little bit, and then I started calling around because there was one weapon I really wanted to learn. And only one school in town taught that weapon. And uh, I finally managed to get my mom to take me there, and boom, I enrolled. And I was taking Kung Fu. And it was the hardest thing I ever did. <laughs> it was really challenging. But it was also so much fun. I had no idea that I would be able to do all of that stuff. And so I started when I was 12. And I'm still doing it. Except now I'm a teacher. And also still a student. We always keep learning it. It's, you know, uh, giving the book to us. Nancy wants to know if you break boards in Kung Fu. I haven't been attacked by a board lately, um, but many schools do breaking as part of their practice. Uh, many years ago, I did do a little bit of iron palm training and broke some cinder blocks, but uh, that was about it for me. I, I decided not to focus on that aspect of the art. So, but a lot of folks do that. That's it. Okay. Um, Can we do a closing? A closing. All right. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Anything? Oh, Priscilla Ann. What Priscilla are some Ann. moves to use for someone with bad knees? Oh, with bad knees. Yeah, that can be uh, that can be a real challenge if your knees are, are hurting. Um, there are a lot of um, a lot of ways that you, you can train in martial arts that will help you with the knees. Sometimes I have folks come in and train and they say that their knees hurt, uh, but then as their legs get stronger, then sometimes that pain goes away. Now, that certainly does not happen all the time, because if you have an injury inside your knees, then you need to look at that. But you can practice Kung Fu uh, at whatever level it works for you. For instance, if you have a horse stance be way down here, or it actually can be up higher because my knees are still bent, my hips are bent. This is a correct stance. If I wanted to challenge my legs a little more, this is also a correct stance. And so a lot of the different stances can be done super low or they can be done higher and it still be correct. And so there are a lot of things that you can do in Kung Fu and in martial arts without getting super low. So, I hope that answers your question. I'm going to and come back yes. and just thank everybody for joining us today. And if you haven't already, please register for summer reading at hcpl.beanstack.org. Thank you so much, Whit. That was awesome and fun. And if you want to rewatch it, it is going to be live here and on YouTube. So, Yay. and I linked your website so folks oh, can you. learn more about you and thank contact you, so you if they have more questions. Wonderful. Thank you all and have a great summer.